There's one thing we all want to know. When bad things happen, when the good thing doesn't come through, there is one question that rises to the top. Why? Now, an important thing to keep in mind as we start this new teaching series is that for most people, when they ask the question why of God, it's not because they're feeling like a philosopher, but instead it's because they are feeling the sting. They are feeling the sting of life in this broken and difficult world. They're feeling the sting of, of their own struggle with sin, of, of death, of, of all the evil things that lurk around us, all the confusion within us. They're feeling the sting of that, and they're lifting their eyes to heaven, and they're saying, well, if you are good, and if you are God, and if you're all powerful, then why do we have to deal with all this? I feel this sting. Why? Why am I feeling it? For most people, the question why is not about playing philosopher. It's about trying to find some rhyme or reason for the sting that we feel in this life. And today, as we kick off this series, we're going to look at what is, what is arguably the foundational question, uh, the, the biggest of whys that people of faith may feel compelled to ask of our God. And that question is, why is sin even allowed in the first place? If you're the author of this whole story, why write a story? Why, why create a reality where it's even possible for mankind to fall into sin and for all that we suffer under and deal with to flow from it? Why? That's a big question. Jump with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 9. In the Gospel of John, chapter 9, Jesus' disciples are just putting together who he is. They're just starting to realize and come to an understanding that he's more than just a really engaging rabbi. He may also be more than, than what they assumed a Messiah would be. In John chapter 8, Jesus tells them something. He says to them, before Abraham was, I am which is no small statement. That it's a very Old Testament-y way of Jesus to say, I am God. And the disciples are just now having those light bulbs come on and they're saying, he, he, he might just be not just the Messiah, but, but, but God himself, God in flesh. And so they bring to Jesus, who may just be God, the kind of question that you or I might bring to God. They're walking down a street and they see this man who is born blind. Blind from birth, probably also uh, homeless, uh, penniless. It's a sad, terrible situation. The disciples see this and then they pivot over to Jesus and they ask him this question. John chapter 9, verse 2. Jesus' disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You see, they're looking for a cause. They're looking for a reason. They're looking for some explanation as to why this, this tragedy, this, this difficulty, this, this terrible scenario exists in the first place. And the text doesn't tell us, but I think it's safe to assume that, that their motivations in asking that question of Jesus is the same motivation that you and I have for asking our questions of why when we see something terrible in the world. We think that if we can get an explanation that we'll have a deeper sense of peace. Or we think that if we, if we get some kind of understanding for why all of this is allowed to exist in this dysfunctional, sinful way, that, that we'll have a greater sense of control in this chaotic world. And so we see something terrible, we see something awful, and we look up to the heavens and we go, why? And certainly you've done that. But certainly you've had a moment where you've experienced something, seen something, and you've lifted your eyes to the skies, and you've said, why, why is this even possible, Lord? And, and maybe you already know this, but, but it's my task to reassure you that it's okay to ask that question. It doesn't make you a bad Christian or a bad person or somehow symbolic of a lack of faith if you, if you look up to God and go, why do you do what you do? Why do you allow what you allow? Why do we find ourselves in this scenario in the first place? That is not a bad thing. It's, it's okay. It's, it's a good thing to ask the big questions of the big guy. But know this. 
when it comes to the biggest of why questions, such as, why is this even possible in the first place? God doesn't answer that question. At least not in a way that is really satisfying to us. Because you see, what you and I are asking when we ask that why question, what we're asking is to get inside the mind of God. What we're asking for is an opportunity to sit on his throne just for a second, just sit where he sits and see his lay of the land, have a bit of his perspective to see what he sees, to know what he knows. We want just a glimpse into his mind thinking that we can handle it, thinking that it will make everything make sense. But here's one thing that we know about God, that God's mind belongs to God alone. And that even though we want a piece of it, he keeps it from us. I'm reminded of this from a couple of scriptures. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. It says this. If you don't know this verse, it's a good one to memorize. Deuteronomy 29, 29. It says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. There are certain things that mankind will never get access to or be privy to. The chief among them being, God, why do you do what you do? Why do you allow what you allow ultimately? Like, why? Why? But the things that are revealed, so there are some things that have been revealed to mankind, belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Isaiah 55. This is the voice of God. This is God speaking to the prophet Isaiah. God says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. We want the mind of God, but God says no. My mind is not yours. Now, the first thing that comes to mind for you and me when we hear that is, well, why? (laughs) Why can't I know what he knows? Why can't I sit in his chair? Why doesn't he let me know the things that he's privy to as God? Well, I think there's at least three reasons why God puts a limit on his answering of why. And the first is this. He knows that the whys will never end. Remember that he's the father, which makes us what? Children. And we are not grown adult children in his eyes. We are tiny, small children. And there's nothing that children love more than the word why. And God knows that if he were to even attempt to give us some sense of understanding his perspective, that it wouldn't satisfy us. We would simply respond with, but why? You can say as eloquently and as clearly as possible to your four-year-old the reasons why bedtime must be at 7.30 p.m. every single night. And your four-year-old is not going to look at you and say, you know what, Dad? That makes a lot of sense. I will see you in the morning. (laughs) No, they're going to look at you and be like, boo, why? And they're going to stall for drinks of water all night long. Second reason why God puts a limit on our ability to get an answer to that question of why when it comes to to his mind is because he knows that even if he did give us an explanation of it, we could not grasp it. Do you think your mind can hold what is in his? Come on. Again, think about it from a parent-child perspective. Your child comes to you and wants to know why you have a one-story house when Johnny has a two-story house. You could say to him, well, when your mom and I were looking for a house, we thought about getting a two-story house, but then your mom made this really good point that if we want this to be our forever home, we might want to reconsider whether or not we want to go up and down stairs when we're in our later years. Plus, with interest rates being the way they are, we don't really know if it's the time to buy a house right now. Do you think your six-year-old is going to care about or understand any of that? No, which is why you look at him and you say, we bought this house because your mom liked the kitchen. Next question. Because he can't grasp it, can't grasp it. Uh, The third reason why God puts a limit on our understanding of the answer to the question why he he does what he does and allows what he allows is not just because it's going to hit a ceiling. It's not just because we're we're not going to understand it. Third reason is this. It's not our business. And I know you hate that one. And I I know you hate it because I hate it too. It's not our business. Uh, 
Who are we to think that God in any capacity has to show us his homework? And yet, that is at the heart of the very first sin. That, that first sin in the Garden of Eden, where, where Adam and Eve eat the fruit they're not supposed to eat because they listen to the serpent who gets them to second-guess all of God's motivations. And basically what the serpent says is, don't you have a right to know what God knows? At the heart of that sin is this idea that God is somehow accountable to man or that the creator is somehow responsible to the creation. And the answer to that is he is not. The primary reason why we don't get to know what he knows is because it is none of our business and we hate that. He is God and we are not and we can't stand it. Now, that's not to say that he, he gives us nothing. And Jesus gives a good example of this. So Jesus, again, in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, he's asked this question, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And, and Jesus gives them an answer. He doesn't tell them why such a thing exists in general. But, but what he does is he says, but, well, he gives them a reason for why that man's blindness in that particular moment is before their eyes. Listen to this. John chapter 9, starting at verse 3 now, Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, now here's the key, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus is speaking in a bit of code here when he says the works of God. He, he's talking about himself. In that particular moment, what is the work of God that he is revealing to the world? Well, it's, it's Jesus and who he is and, and what he brings and all that he's going to accomplish. So Jesus is saying this, this man is before our eyes blind because God is going to use him to continue to reveal to you who I am. And immediately after that statement, what does Jesus do? Jesus takes some saliva and he, and he takes some dirt from the ground and he rubs it all together and like Mr. Miyagi style... 80s reference, he, he puts it on the eyes of the man born blind, and then once the man rinses his eyes in the pool as commanded by Jesus, what happens? He can see. And what does that further affirm for the disciples? This man's not just a rabbi. He's not just the, the Messiah. He's even more than that. He is God in flesh. He gives the blind their sight. He exists in that moment to reveal the greatness of God in Jesus Christ. That's why he's there. And Jesus says immediately after that moment, he says, but what's more important is not that this man gains his sight, but that the world gain its sight and see me because I, Jesus Christ, am the light of the world. And what does he mean by that? Jesus is the means by which humanity will be able to see and perceive what can be known of God. There are things that you will never know of God because he's God and you're not. But there are things that are revealed to you and me that we must know, that we need to know, that we're dying to know in order to live. And Jesus is the light that shines on the reality of God and shows those necessary things to us. I like to put it like this. You cannot know the mind of God, but... But Jesus reveals to us the heart of God. And, and those are the things that we, that we can know. We, we can know how God feels about us. We can know what are his plans for us. We can know the promises that he's made to all of us. That's the heart of God. And I would argue the heart is better than the mind in this particular case. You may want an answer to all these other questions, but what you need is God's heart revealed to you in Jesus Christ, how much he loves you, what his plans are for you, and all the promises that are true for you. That's what you need to know, and that's what is accessible to you through Jesus Christ, the heart of God. So now, grasping that, that we get access to the heart of God through the person and work of Jesus Christ, what can we know about our sin-sick situation? 
What can we know about the harsh realities of this world? How do we make sense of them? Not having access to God's mind, but in light of God's heart in Jesus Christ. Well, let's do that. And the first thing is this. Looking at God's heart in the person and work of Jesus Christ, the first thing we understand about this sinful situation we find ourselves in, number one, is that it is God's desire to rescue us from it. It is God's heart to rescue us from it. I can't tell you why it's allowed to exist in the first place. That's for God to know and me to find out maybe later in eternity. But right now what I do know, it is God's heart to rescue you from it. And God gives hints of that in the very beginning. So Genesis 3, mankind falls into sin. Not five seconds later, God is calling out the serpent, Satan, saying, look, your day is coming. There's going to come one through the line of Eve, someone in flesh and bone who is going to confront you, and you're going to strike his heel, but he is going to crush your head. A confrontation with sin, death, and the devil is coming. That's an allusion to Jesus. And then later on in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden. They're outside of God's family as a result of their sin. They're, they're standing naked and afraid, not the TV show, but like naked and afraid, in actuality, and, and they're full of shame, and God sees that. He has compassion on them, and here's what he does. He kills an animal. Now, prior to this moment, there's never been any death in creation, never been any blood spilt in creation. So an innocent creature, innocent blood is spilled, and the leather of that first kill in creation is used to create clothing to cover the sin and the shame of Adam and Eve. What do you think that's pointing to? That's pointing to Jesus. And sure enough, Jesus shows up and, and he's like this giant blinking red arrow to all of those predictions and promises. He shows up and he's like, look, I'm the one who's going to confront sin, death, and the devil. It's going to strike me on a cross, but I'm going to crush its head in my resurrection. And I'm the one who, through the shedding of my innocent blood, through my death, I'm going to create a covering over the sin and shame, not of two people, but all people, through my life, death, and resurrection. I'm the one that is providing the rescue out from under the implications of sin. And indeed, he has. In Jesus Christ, you are no longer kicked out of the garden as a member of humanity. You are brought into the family, into the fold, through who he is and what he's done. You are in the family. You are in the garden once again. And yes, there is accountability for sin. There are repercussions for sin. But God, in his great mercy, has decided not to put the accountability for sin on the shoulders of mankind, but to put the accountability for the sin on the capable and crucified shoulders of his son, Jesus Christ. So now, sin is paid for utterly and completely in Jesus Christ. And when bad things happen in the sinful, broken world, you never, ever, ever have to ask the question, is God punishing me? No, he's out of that business. He punished your sin in Jesus. Now you are just a forgiven child of God living in a broken world that will one day not be broken when he comes back. That's the reality of things. He has rescued you from the repercussions of sin and brought you into his family. And that's important to hold on to because as you are tossed back and forth in this still struggling, still broken, waiting for Jesus to return and make it all better world, if you hold on to that truth that you've been rescued from the implications of sin, what you get to declare into this broken world is this, that this sin, this struggle will not win. It won't win. Because Jesus Christ has already crushed it. That's what the heart of God shows us. The second thing we know, looking at the heart of God to the person of Jesus Christ about the reality of sin in this world, the second thing we know is not just that God is going to rescue us from it, but that he loves us so much he would join us in it. That's what love does. If love can help it, it doesn't just send a text message and some well wishes. If you're, if you're living under the weight of something, living under the burden of something, what love does is it shows up and it bears that weight, it feels that burden with you, doesn't it? If you love me, be here with me if you can. And so what do we believe about God? That God in Jesus Christ took on flesh and he has worn our weakness. He has felt your difficulty 
all the slings and arrows, so to speak, of life as a human being. He has felt those and put himself underneath the weight of those things. He has joined us in it. I mean, think about how amazing this is. Like, think about it in the context of other so-called religious leaders, okay? Uh, think about it in the context of, like, um, like the, the Buddha and how his life ended. The Buddha ended surrounded by family and a bunch of disciples celebrated as a teacher late, late, late in his years. Sounds like a good way to go. Uh, Confucius. Confucius died surrounded by disciples late in years who'd become a celebrated sa sage in Chinese society. Sounds pretty good. Muhammad. Muhammad is said to have died in the arms of one of his many wives, this particular wife who had become a leader in Arabia. How does Jesus, who's not just a religious teacher, but is God's own son, God in flesh, he, he enters into this world, and what is his experience? He places himself under the worst of it all. How does he die? He dies at the young old age of 33, and he's executed in the worst possible way. All that to say, the worst of what this world has to offer, he put himself under it, and he did it for you. Now, how does that help you navigate these questions of why life is so terrible and what we all have to go through? Because if you hold tight to that truth, what it tells you in the middle of a sin-sick world is this. You are never alone. Sin won't win. And you are never alone. Because Jesus has been in it and under it with you for you. Third thing it tells us, as we look at the heart of God and the person of Jesus and we attempt to understand the reality of life in this, this sin-riddled world, it tells us, as we look at Christ, that God is using all of this for good. Now, that's not to say that we are going to be able to see how he uses your struggles and mine for good or comprehend how he even possibly could. But what we see in Jesus Christ is that God takes the worst that this world has to offer and he is able to redeem it. To redeem something is to pull it out of captivity and use it for a better purpose. So he takes the pains and the struggles and the issues of this life and he pulls them out of the captivity of simply being pains and meaningless struggles of this life and he uses them in a way in which only he can to usher all things toward his good and glorious ending, to usher all of it towards more glory for him and more blessing for us. Now, I understand that, that you are probably sitting there thinking, Matt, like on one level I get that, but on the other level I've got this long list of, of truly horrific things that I have had to endure in my life and I can't possibly see how God could A, ever allow it or B, ever use it in any capacity to bring him glory, ever. And I'm not going to try and talk you out of that. I'm not going to try and undermine that at all. I have those things too where I can't reconcile what I've been through and what God promises. And in that gap is faith and trust in the goodness of God. There are some knots that I can't untie, but I have to believe that he can. And make it make sense, Lord, to you. When I feel that, I, I think of... Um, I, can, I think of this quote from Tim Keller. Tim Keller was a, a pastor and a theologian who, who, who blessed me, uh, helped me personally. And uh, just about two weeks ago, he passed away. And one of the things that he said in, in light of all this, one of the things he said is, is this. I wrote it down and I, 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 will, I will hold on to it forever. He's, he, he said this. He said, what, what time and perspective, rather, with time and perspective, most of us can see good reasons for at least some of the tragedy and pain that occurs in life. As time goes on, most of us are able to look at some of the pain we go through and go, you know what? I can see some good that's come of that and some reason for that. Why couldn't it be possible that from God's vantage point, there are good reasons for all of them? If from my limited vantage point, I'm able to see good reasons for some of the difficulties I've gone through, is it not possible that from God's unlimited vantage point, he is able to see good reasons, glorious reasons for all of it? If we have a God who is big enough to blame for the problem of sin, and the problem of evil, then we have a God who is big enough to have reasons for it and ways to redeem it that we can't possibly understand. 
And what we have to do in the end is look at the heart of God in Jesus Christ and say, well, I don't know how he's going to make good out of this, but I know he loves me. And I know he's going to work it towards good in his time as he defines in his will and his ways. I, I can't answer the question of, of why, but I can tell you this. In the middle of this difficult world, what you can know is that your pain, your sorrow, your tragedy will not be wasted. At the very least, God will use everything you've gone through to make what he accomplishes in the end at the return of Jesus Christ and fixing all things. He'll use what you've gone through today to make that tomorrow taste even sweeter. And, and isn't that, in and of itself, isn't that a victory worth celebrating? That the, like at the end of Joseph's story in Genesis chapter 50, he's put in a well and he's able to say to his brothers who abandoned him, a world that betrayed him, he's able to say what you intended for harm, God has used for good. The bad things in this life in the very end, at the very least, will only make the greatest of things when it comes be even sweeter. There's one question we all ask, why? And when we ask that question, why, of God, we're not playing philosopher, it's because we're feeling the sting. And maybe you are feeling the sting right now. And if you are, my pastoral encouragement to you is, um, is to call out to the heart of God. I know you want his mind, and I do too, but we can't get it. He's given us something better. He's given us his heart in Jesus Christ. Call out to the light who shows you the heart of God, who is the heart of God. And here's what you can know in a world of questions. What you can know in a world of questions is that this thing that you're facing, it will not win. This thing that you're facing, it will not last. This thing that you're facing will not be wasted. God is working all things for good. And knowing that, my friends, in Jesus Christ is good enough. Let us believe that. Amen.